So this is one of our more recent toys. We just finished this study, NAC in unipolar depression. Uh, we published this a couple of months ago in Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. And this is the primary finding. So the primary finding is a very modest benefit. You can see the curves gradually separating between NAC and placebo. It took an awful long time. You're only really clearly seeing anything at 16 weeks. Um, and the difference between drug and placebo is small. But it's also true that the difference between drug and placebo in many modern antidepressant studies is small. And I have to tell you, I am, we struggle with antidepressant studies. We really struggle because of what I call service filters. So this is what I mean by service filter. Service filter is, you're depressed, what do you do? You go to your GP. And our GPs are bloody well trained these days. And they're going to give you a treatment. So you'll either get CBT or you'll get an SSRI. And what happens? You get better, you don't. You get better, you filter it out. You don't get better, they try something else. If you don't get better, they might refer them to you. And if you, don't, if you try and you bat on and you would bat on, and eventually if you fail, they see an advert or they hear of a study and they say, right, we'll give it a go. So we don't get clean, straightforward, drug responsive people in our study. So I think that this is not, in the same way that I don't think any modern antidepressant studies represent the true population of treated depressed individuals, I don't think we do. So I think it's really hard to have a clear sense of how well NAC works. But this is the data we have. So let me just break down the data a little bit more to show you what we found. So we looked at the effect of NAC with age. Did age make a difference? And the answer is yes. So we found in middle-aged individuals, it seems to separate. In youngsters, doesn't work. And the elderly, doesn't work. So then the question is, should that surprise us at all? And I'd say the answer is no. And this is the reason why. So this is a paper we've just published. So we got hold of all the Eli Lilly data on the duloxetine and fluoxetine. Right? This is all the published studies on Prozac and Cymbalta. And this is response versus age. So le let's just start with the SSRI one. If you look at the left-hand side, this is youngsters, 20, 30, 40, 50 year olds, you can see no separation at all between SSRI and placebo in young people. And the reason is uh, you've got this massive placebo response. This is the blackest placebo. You've got this huge spike in placebo response in young people. Uh, which drowns out any signal of antidepressant efficacy. And then the elderly, what you see is this drop off in response, such that even though placebo is now old in middle, lower in middle aged and elderly individuals, once you're getting older, because the active response to active medication declines, the, the curves are now overlapping. So you only get in clear air between SSRI and placebo in middle aged individuals. Does this fit with your clinical experience? So, but it's not that, it's, again, my argument is not that it's not working in young people, it's that the placebo response is so high in young people. And if you look at duloxetine, you see exactly the same. Huge placebo responses, they decline as you get older, um, and you've got clear air between drug and placebo only in middle-aged individuals. The other thing is the effect of severity, and we only saw an effect of NAC in people with a madras over 25, in other words, severe depression. And I think many of you would be familiar with the meta-analyses of these big meta-analyses of antidepressants, uh, which again suggest at least the modern antidepressant studies are only doing much in people who are depressed. Let's go back to your mother's advice. Should you believe this? Does this mean anything? Can you take this home and do anything about it on the basis of one iffy study? Answer is no. You have to wait until it's replicated and until it hits meta-analysis level. The good news is the field is moving bloody fast indeed. So let me show you our latest study which came out two weeks ago. And this is NAC in therapy resistant tobacco use disorders. So it's a pilot starter, small n, only about 47 individuals. So you have to be cautious about pilot study and small samples. But this is what we found. So the headline result in this tobacco smoking study is 47% of individuals taking NAC versus 
of people taking placebo were able to quit smoking. That's a really robust result. Uh, we've put this into NHMRC twice, been knocked back twice, but we hope with these pilot data we'll get it funded. And we'll be able to do this in a decent study. So, yeah? Uh, I think it was three months. So if you look at numbers of cigarettes per day, you can see a reduction of number of cigarettes per day. We measured exhaled carbon monoxide as an objective test, and you can see it declining in the NAC group. But in terms of the depression, just to go back to where I started from, you see a reduction in symptoms of the Hamilton depression rating scale. There are some other studies of NAC in depression which were accidental. And I love accidental findings because everything in psychiatry that's useful is an accident. So this is a, a study of NAC in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, if you're a scientific um, snob, you'd look at the very bottom left-hand corner and see it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which means it's the best and most methodologically rigorous science that's out there. So the first thing I'll tell you about the study is that it absolutely bug splat to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. No effect at all. But what it did do is it had a statistically significant effect on mental health, on, um, uh, on, on the mental health measure on the SF36, which is a quality of life score. So what you can see here is that because it's a, de a declining degenerative disorder, um, compared to baseline and endpoint, people's mental health declined a lot in the placebo group, but it was completely preserved in the N-acetylcysteine group. So this was a highly statistically significant finding that your mental health held up if you took NAC, did nothing to your lungs, but you felt better about dying. <laughs> so this is by far the most methodologically rigorous study that's been done to date, and it's a wonderful study. So what this does, if you put it all together, it gives us meta-analysis level of evidence. And this paper has just been accepted in, uh, literally yesterday in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, should be coming out. And here you can see meta-analysis level of evidence. You can see the big triangle on the right of the dividing line suggesting aggregate efficacy of n acetylcysteine in depression. So the whole field has gone from, moved from no data to replicated data to meta-analysis in the period of about six months. It's moving very, very quickly. Okay, I'm going to change gears completely now. And I'm going to pick up a thread that I dropped in the room uh, right at the very beginning when I spoke about mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, why the hell should a psychiatrist be interested in mitochondria? Why should anybody interested in bipolar disorder be interested in mitochondria? Now, you know mitochondria are the generators of energy. And it is my belief, increasingly, that bipolar disorder is primarily a disorder of energy. When you're manic, you have energy to burn, and you do. And when you're depressed, you don't have the energy to get out of bed and shower. That's what we see clinically, and you see this biochemically too. So here's a, a, probably one of the earliest studies. I'm showing it to you because it's really historical. We've now known this since 1985. So this is, uh, in, in, in uh, science terms, this is uh, an age. When, when you're manic, the brain is on fire. And when you're depressed, the lights are out and nobody's home. So this is brain energy generation. This is uh, glucose utilization. You can see this when you look at VO2 max. So VO2 max is what the sports scientists used to see how well you're burning energy. And here you can see in the manic stage, whether you look at resting energy expenditure or VO2 max, you see this massive increase in energy expenditure in people who manic. Now, as a clinician, this should not surprise you at all. But as a researcher, the question to ask is, is this a druggable target? Can we do anything the hell about this? And the answer is maybe. So here's another piece of evidence I want to show you. So this is actually looking at the mitochondrial electron transport chain. So this is post-mortem data. So this is complex one of the electron transport chain. And you can see it's dramatically down-regulated in bipolar disorder compared to schizophrenia and major depression. So again, suggesting that there's a significant problem 
in the body's ability to generate energy in, in bipolar disorder. Here's another paper that was published only um, a couple of months ago where they looked at mitochondrial respiration and they looked at correlation with the severity of depression. So whether you're looking at routine respiration, uncoupled respiration, coupled efficiency, spare respiratory capacity, pretty much every one of these, if you look at symptoms on the, on the Beck and the Montgomery, there's this correlation between how depressed you are and how stuffed your mitochondrial energy generation is. The more depressed you are, the less energy your body is able to generate. Do you want to come back to uh, and ask one of those dumb questions? There are no dumb questions, only dumb answers. How, how do you measure activity in someone who's dead? It says post-mortem OK, so this is just measuring levels of complex 1. So it measures the, the, the amount of the protein of the complex 1. Uh, and the assumption is that the amount of complex 1 would translate into the efficiency of the. Um, so it's just there. But it's it's just, doing well, it's, no, there's much less of it. Yeah. There's much, much less of it. Then you can measure it in an assay. So this, the whole idea that there's mitochondrial abnormalities in bipolar disorder is not a completely new thing. And if truth be told, it's true across all psychiatric disorders. So there's evidence that we've got mitochondrial dysfunction in multiple sclerosis, in chronic fatigue, in schizophrenia, in depression, bipolar disorder, autism. It's not a specific finding, but it's a very common finding. Um, and I, I think one of the things, again, I'm not going into this in any uh, depth today, because it's not really the focus of my lecture. but Many of these biomarkers are common across psychiatric disorders. And the DSM has no respect for the biomarkers that we're interested in. So they do not segregate at all by diagnosis. So the, as I said, my interest is, can we take any of this knowledge and help anybody? Because I'm really only interested in taking this and coming up with something that might help somebody one day. Um, and the answer is a, a resounding maybe. There are uh, lots and lots of druggable targets. And again, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but if you look at any one of these elements in the mitochondrial chain, there's something that fiddles with it. So if you're looking at antioxidants, well, we've got coenzyme Q10, vitamin E. Uh, if you're looking at the Krebs cycle, you can give nicotinamide, carnitine. If you're looking at fatty acid oxidation, you can give L-carnitine. You can give all kinds of things, tamoxifen. And so it goes on. So I'm not going to bore you with all of these things. Suffice it to say that many of these are druggable targets. So then we decided to do a study, which we're still doing. So we got what we're calling the mitochondrial cocktail study, which is currently running in Geelong and currently running at the Melbourne Clinic. So if you have anybody who's got bipolar disorder who's depressed uh, and you're struggling to get them better, we'd be delighted to try and help and see if this cocktail helps. So we've come up with a cocktail of available, safe nutraceutical agents. They include N-acetylcysteine, carnitine, ubiquinone, um, alpha-tocopherol, uh, ascorbic acid, alpha-lipoic acid. Compare this to NAC alone and placebo. And this study is currently running. We aim to finish by the end of the year, and we'll have data probably by early this time next year. So we'll be able to answer the question that if you boost mitochondrial function in somebody who's depressed, can this help reverse depression? So we don't know yet. But as far as we know, this is the first study that's ever been done in bipolar disorder targeting the mitochondrial hypothesis.